Now, when we come to testing of the facial nerve, how should we test? Now, we know the facial nerve comes from the cerebral hemisphere and ends at the level of five terminal branches. We need to have different uh, approaches to facial nerve as to understand where could be the possibility of lesion. So, if you are thinking of a lesion which is supranuclear, somewhere in the cerebral cortex or nuclear in the level of pons or infranuclear from pons to the internal auditory meatus because they are all part of your intracranial segment they are within the cranium what will you do you will do a neurological examination a ct and an mri to identify if there is any brain related issue that is responsible for causing facial nerve palsy now if you have a, a lesion in the intratemporal course of the facial nerve so you have a course intratemporal course in the internal auditory meatus you can do an electroneuronography an audiological testing and a ct scan at the level of geniculate ganglion you can do for tear testing tympanomastoid suture you can do stepedial reflex taste and salivation and extracranial you can look for facial movement so these are how you're going to test the facial nerve function but to simplify we do something called as topo diagnostic test which helps you to identify where exactly Exactly the nerve has been damaged. So the common test that we do is Schirmer's test. We do stepedial reflex test. We understand the taste by electrogustometry and by salivary flow testing. Based upon these tests, we will be able to localize where is the lesion of the facial nerve. How? Let us understand. So we know that the facial nerve gives rise to the branches. So this is our labyrinthine segment. This is our tympanic segment. This is our mastoid segment. So the labyrinthine segment to the tympanic segment, we call this as the first genu, also called as geniculate ganglion. Now this first genu or geniculate ganglion gives rise to a branch which is called as GSPN, greater superficial petrosal nerve. We know that this greater superficial petrosal nerve is responsible for supplying which gland to the lacrimal gland. Then we have got the second branch coming which is from the second genu. From the second genu we have the nerve to stepedius. Just below the second genu, we have the nerve to stepedius. This nerve to stepedius will supply the stepedius muscle. And how do we assess it? By doing an acoustic reflex or a stepedial reflex test. Now, just before it exits the stylomastoid foramen, the facial nerve gives rise to two branches. The one branch is called as corda tympani nerve. This corda tympani nerve is responsible for supplying taste sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and we can also objectively assess this by doing an electrogustometry. Then it also supplies submandibular and sublingual salivary glands via the lesser petrosal nerve. And how do we assess this? By salivary flow testing. So let us presume that there is a patient who is having an injury to the facial nerve above the level of first genu or geniculate ganglion. So if we have a suprageniculate lesion, will there be any conduction of impulses below? No. So as a result, when you do Schirmer's test for lacrimation, will it show you good lacrimation or reduced lacrimation? Of course, there will be reduced lacrimation. What would happen to acoustic reflex? It would be absent. What would happen to taste sensation? Taste sensation would be lost. And what would happen to salivary flow? That would be reduced. And finally, the five terminal branches which supply the face, will they have paralysis? Yes, so there will be an element type of facial paralysis. So this is how we are going to understand where is the lesion. So if we do this test, we are able to understand exactly where is the lesion present and that is called as topo diagnosis. So if I tell you that there is a suprageniculate lesion, meaning above the geniculate ganglion, what will happen? Schirmer's test will be 
negative. There will be reduced flow. Tepidial reflex will be absent because the nerve to stepidius will no longer function. What will happen to taste on electrogustometry? It will be reduced. What will happen to salivary flow? It will be reduced. And finally, will there be LM and palsy of the face? Yes. So, when you have all the tests that you have done negative and there is element type of facial palsy, you will think that the lesion is suprageniculate, which means there is a lesion above the first genio. So, it could be the labyrinthine segment, it could be the neatal segment or it could be the pontine segment. Anywhere along there, there is a lesion of the facial nerve. Now, let us presume a situation where the lesion is suprastepedial, meaning the lesion is above the nerve to stepedius. So, what nerve will be spared? What nerve comes before the stepedius? It is the greater superficial petrosal nerve. So, Schirmer's test will be preserved because that nerve is still going to have continuity, but stepedial reflex will be lost, taste will be lost, salivary flow will be reduced, and there will be element type of facial palsy. Now, if we think about a lesion which is below the nerve to stepedius, which we call it as infrastepedial. So, if we have an infrastepedial lesion, what two nerves will be spared? A nerve has got injured below the nerve to stepidus. So, your lacrimation will be preserved, stepidial reflex will be preserved, but still there will be loss of taste and salivation and there will be element type of facial palsy. Then, if we have an infracordal lesion, meaning the lesion is below the corda tympani, then we have lacrimation spared stepidial reflex spared, taste spared, but the salivary flow will be reduced and there will be an element type of facial palsy. So, based upon our uh, diagnostic test, can we locate where is the nerve injured? Yes. So, if all our tests are negative with an element type of facial palsy, it is suprageniculate. If only the GSPN is preserved with good lacrimation, rest of them are negative, then it is suprastepidial. If it is sparing the lacrimation and stepidial reflex, infrastepidial. Sparing lacrimation, stepidial reflex and taste, it is infracordal. So, this way we can topologically identify where the nerve has been injured, helping us to further focus on what should we do in the management of these patients. So, this is about the facial nerve topo diagnosis. Now, let us understand what are the electrophysiological tests. So, why do we do electrophysiological? test first to understand what is the amount of viable neuropraxic axons. Is there a potential for recovery? Is there a potential for re And is repair contraindicated or indicated? For that, we need to do some electrophysiological test. So, for that, we have got nerve excitability test and maximal stimulation test. So, what is nerve excitability test? Minimum nerve excitability test. The name itself is indicative. The minimum amount of stimulation that is required to excite a nerve, we call it as minimal nerve excitability test. So, it is here we do give a transcutaneous currents to elicit minimal muscle contraction between in the facial muscles of the right side and the left side. So, if say right side required 10 milliamperes of current, the left side required only 2 milliamperes of current for causing that minimal contraction. What does that mean? The right side is requiring more amount of electrical stimulation as compared to left side, which means that on the right side, there is definitely the conduction problem. Now, what is significant? If the difference between the both sides is more than 3.5 milliamperes, then it signifies that it is a poor recovery, meaning the as compared to the normal side, the deceased side is going to have a poor recovery if the difference between the normal and the deceased side is more than 3.5 milliamperes. Now, what is the next test? The next test is called as maximal stimulation test. So, first one was minimal excitability test. So, minimum current required for excitation of the muscle. Maximum stimulation test is comparing the muscle contraction at maximal nerve stimulation between two sets. So, you are comparing the muscle contraction of right side and muscle contraction of left side and you are identifying what is the difference. So, the responses on both the side could be equal. One side it may be reduced or absent. 
If there is a loss of response within 10 days, it signifies incomplete recovery. If you do not have response within 10 days, it will signify that there could be an incomplete recovery. The next one is called as electroneuronography. So here what we do, we give a supramaximal stimulus to the facial nerve trunk at the stylomastoid foramen. And what are we giving when we're giving a current to the facial nerve, which is supramaximal stimulus, it should cause contraction of the facial muscles. If we are comparing the normal side contraction with that of the paralyzed side, what happens here, the response of the paralyzed side is compared with that of normal side, which serves as a control and the percentage of degenerated fibers is is calculated. Now let's take an example. Now say this is the patient and if we have given to the facial nerve tongue trunk at the stylomastoid foramen a supramaximal stimulus on the right side and the left side. So right side is paralyzed side, left side is normal side. Now we have given the same amount of stimulus to both and it is the supramaximal, more than maximum possible we have given that amount of stimulus. Right side say the contraction was 10%, left side say the contraction was 100%. So what is the difference? Can I say that the right side is responding 90% lesser as compared to left side? Yes. So when you have such reduction, it is significant. So reduction in the compound muscle action co-potential correlates with that of axonal loss. If the compound muscle action potential on the affected side is 10% and that of the normal side, then the patient has sustained 90% axonal loss. So in Bell's palsy, if there is more than 90% degeneration that develops within 14 days of complete paralysis, it indicates poor recovery. And if the patient is having more than 90% of fibers that are damaged, of course, it wants you to do an early intervention. It is not useful in Ramsey-Hunt syndrome because in Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, you may have multiple sites of nerve involvement and not just a single site of nerve involvement. So you might not do this test for patients with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So in electro neuronography, what are we doing? We are comparing the compound muscle action potential of the deceased side with that of the normal side. Normally, what do we see? That equal response has to be obtained on both the sides. Now, if say one side is paralyzed and the other side is normal, the opposite side gave us a 100% response. In relation to the normal side, how much is the response that we get from the paralyzed side is what we see. If there is more than 90% reduction, it means that more than 90% of axons have been lost and this would mandate you or warrant you to take an early intervention. Now, electromyography. Electromyography is a test where we are recording at the level of muscle what are the potentials that are generated. So, when you give an electrical stimulus, at the level of muscle, what potentials you're getting? Are you getting polyphasic potentials? Are you getting fibrillation potentials? Or are you getting some violational activity? So that you're going to check. So if you're getting violational activity, it the nerve in question is in fact in continuity. It means that the nerve is continuous. If there is fibrillation potential, it tells you that there is some amount of valerian degeneration. And if there is re of the nerve, you will see polyphasic potentials. So if you get fibrillation potential after 10 to 14 days of facial nerve palsy, what does that mean? It means that the degenerating motor units indicating incomplete recovery. So you are possibly going to think of probably changing from medical therapy now to going for surgical intervention. If you're getting polyphasic potentials four to six weeks after the onset of facial nerve palsy, it indicates that there could be early clinical detectable recovery and it is a fair to good recovery. Anastomosis in long-standing paralysis. If EMG shows no polyphasic innervation at 15 to 18 months, it means that your procedure has failed. Failed. So at least 15 to 18 months within that you must get this polyphasic potentials. If you don't, then it means that your procedure has failed. So that is what we do when we are thinking of lesions in the temporal or the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. Whenever we are thinking of lesions in the intracranial, we take CT, MRI and neurological examination as our investigation tools. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve can be seen in the axial scale at the level of body of incus and its short process. It can be followed properly 
proximally and distally towards the labyrinthine segment and the descending part. The labyrinthine segment is like a banana shaped on the axial section. On coronal images, the medial of the two circular eyes directly above the cochlea. So on coronal images, you will see that there are two circular eyes that is above the cochlea and uh, the sulcus of the geniculate ganglion can be seen. So let us see these scans here. So if you see this, this portion is going to be your labyrinthine portion. So basically this is your internal auditory canal. This is your facial nerve going from the labyrinthine segment and then turning to the medial wall of the middle ear. So this bend here is your geniculate ganglion that you can see. Now you can see here the facial nerve in the mastoid part. Okay, so this is the course of the facial nerve in the mastoid. MRI can be done to identify uh, the facial nerve. Normally on a T1 weighted MRI, you will see that it will enhance. And if there is an abnormal enhancement, you must look for any cisternal or canalicular segment or the extracranial segment of the facial nerve to be involved.